There's an interesting passage where the Buddha says that you need both tranquility and insight in order to get the mind into right concentration. In the Pali terms are for tranquility, samatha, insight, vipassana. You need them both for there to be right concentration. This goes against the idea that sometimes you hear that there are two very distinct kinds of meditation that the Buddha teaches. One is tranquility meditation and the other is vipassana meditation. Tranquility is when you sit very still and don't, don't do anything at all. Vipassana is where you gain your understanding. Vipassana does all the work. Tranquility is just kind of a, a lazy man's out or a lazy woman's out, a waste of time, the scenic route as opposed to the direct route. But that's not how the Buddha taught it. When he told the monks to go meditate, he said, go do jhana, get the mind absorbed. And as he said, for the mind to get into a state of absorption, you need to both learn how to still the mind and get it to settle down, to enjoy the stillness. But at the same time, you need to learn how to question the way the mind acts, the way it fabricates things. You need to gain insight into these things. If you don't have any insight, you can't really have any real measure of control over the mind and bring the mind into the right balance of right concentration. So it's not just stump concentration, as they call it in the forest tradition. We sit there like a stump with no powers of observation, no understanding at all. And at the same time, you don't go wandering off into the thoughts and analysis and world of perceptions that, and now that insight practice without any good solid concentration foundation can lead you. So you need the two qualities together. They work together. The stillness is what enables you to see. Now you can just use the stillness and get carried away by the stillness and refuse to see. That's one extreme. But without genuine stillness, your ideas of what you've tried to analyze the mind in action end up to be more just perceptions, labels, ideas that you picked up from the books, you picked up from the teachers, and basically figure things out. But because the mind isn't still, you're not really observing it as carefully as you could, because there are a lot of unexpected insights. After all, if it's just a matter of trying to see things the way they are in the books, there's always, there's always the question of, are you simply programming the mind, forcing it into a mold? When the Buddha taught insight, he didn't teach a technique, he just taught a series of questions. How do you look at the fabrications of the mind, he said. That's a question he posed, and then you have to learn how to look at that yourself. How do you regard fabrications? How do you understand them? You pose questions in the mind. It's in the posing of the question you start getting insight. When you approach insight as an issue, not of trying to force the mind into a mold, but as a series of continual questions. What is the mind doing? What does it fabricate? What does it create? How are its fabrications skillful? How are they not? When you take that questioning attitude and you combine it with the stillness, that's when the mind really reaches breakthroughs in understanding, it catches itself in action as it creates suffering. Because one of the natures of the mind is that it creates a lot of experience. We don't just deal with raw data thrown at us. We process them. And it's in the processing that we make a lot of changes, many of which we're not even aware of because it's so subconscious. And one of the purposes of the meditation is to bring all of this up into the light of consciousness, which requires both stillness and a questioning attitude. So you can't say beforehand, well, I only need X amount of concentration in order to gain awakening. Because for each person it's more a matter of what your habits are, what your problems are, where your mind tends to create unnecessary issues, and learning to see through that. As one of the suttas says, with some people the practice is slow and comfortable, with others it's fast and comfortable. With some it's slow and difficult, and others it's fast and difficult. And of course, if we had our choice, we'd all go take the fast and easy, comfortable way. 
But it's not something that we can choose. We've got our own individual issues. And with some of us, the meditation is going to be difficult. It's going to take a long time. Or maybe pleasant, but still take a long time. In other words, some people, when the mind just gets the first stage of right concentration, the first jhana, they immediately gain the insight that they need for awakening. Those are the people whose powers of insight, their powers of watching themselves, are really sharp. They don't need that much stillness. But for other people, it takes a lot of stillness. And again, you can't decide beforehand whether you have time for a lot of stillness. It's what you need. If it's what you need, you've got to do it. So you try to combine these qualities of tranquility and insight in the process of getting the mind to settle down. After all, it's important for the mind to settle down. You've got to get past what are called the hindrances. These are five obstacles to getting the mind really in good, solid concentration. And if you don't understand how the mind gets involved in these things, you're not going to be able to get past them. So that, in the very beginning, just getting the mind to settle down requires a certain amount of insight. The first hindrance is sensual desire. The second is ill will. Third is sloth and torpor. Fourth is restlessness and anxiety. And the fifth is uncertainty. The first is re more related to passion. The second, ill will, is more related to aversion. And the last three are more related to delusion, one way or another. And the only way you're going to get past these things is to learn to understand them. Because in each case, we tend to fall in with a hindrance. We believe it. That's why we get ensnared in it. When we start thinking about things we like, sensual sights, sounds, tastes, tactile sensations, aromas. You start thinking about them and part of your mind says, yeah, these things really are attractive. These really are desirable. And it's because you believe in the, the hindrance, that's why it takes over. The same with ill will. When someone has been really nasty, it's easy to say, well, this person really deserves to suffer. I'd really like to see them squirm. Again, you fall and you believe for the hin you believed in what the hindrance has to say. Sloth and torpor come along and say, yeah, I really am tired. I really do need some sleep. Restless and anxiety. Oh, these things really have to be worried about. This is things you've got to prepare for. There really could be a big problem. Or uncertainty. You just can't see for sure this this path that we're following here. Does it really do any good at all to be sitting here with our eyes closed, watching the breath? You start wondering. And so as long as you believe in these things, it's very difficult to get past them. That's why you have to learn how to question them. This is where the insight comes in. But it has long suttas devoted to for instance, the problem of sensual desire. The fact that we desire these things, what do we have to do in order to get what we want? Well, we have to work and we have to. Sometimes we get into arguments and we get into wars. If you want to drive around, you need all the oil you can get. Well, the oil is not buried under our sand, it's buried under somebody else's sand. So they're wars. If you want somebody and somebody else wants that person, there are going to be fights. Or you want the money to buy the things that you want? Well, you've got to work hard. You've got to sit in miserable jobs that if they didn't pay you, you would never touch. These are some of the drawbacks of sensuality. So every time you get the mind tied up into sensual thoughts, just remind yourself, okay, if you wanted to actually gain that object or that person, what would you have to do? And try to think of all the implications, not just the nice ones, because we tend to dress things up, focusing only on the good things and forgetting the bad things. But you've got to keep reminding yourself, well, these are the implications. You want a body that has all these sensual pleasures? We've got to feed it. You've got to clothe it. You've got to find shelter. You've got to take care of all its illnesses. So 
learn to look at the drawbacks of sensual desire so that the next time it comes up you don't so easily fall for it. Always learn to question these things. Same with ill will. Okay, maybe that person that you have ill will for maybe really is a horrible person, but what about you? Is it good for you to be sitting here raging and fuming? The Buddha has you think about the fact that if the more you think about other people's bad qualities, you start seeing the whole human race as being discouraging, disappointing. And then you yourself, what happens to your own goodness? There's that great cartoon in the New Yorker, these two dogs dressed up, female dogs, long eyelashes, at a bar. And one of them is saying to the other, they're all sons of bitches. <laughs> okay, when everybody else is a son of a bitch, you start turning into a son of a bitch. The image the Buddha gives is of someone trembling from thirst and heat, walking through the desert and finding a little cow print with a little bit of water in it. So they need the water in the cow print. And they have to be very careful when they they can't scoop it up in their hands because they'll muddy it, so they have to get down and slurp it up. And the says, regard the goodness of bad people in the same way. You look for their goodness. You've got to see that there's the goodness of other people because you need the water of their goodness to water your own goodness, to keep it alive. So learn how to question your ill will. Same with sloth and torpor. The Buddha has a whole series of exercises that when you find yourself sitting here sleeping and nodding off, to question it. Does a body really need rest, or is it simply a matter of boredom? Part of your mind is looking for something else. doesn't like being here meditating with a breath, after all. What's that saying? If it's not boring, it's not Buddhism? That's not really the case. There's actually a lot of interesting things going on right now. You've got this whole body sitting here with all of its little parts. You've got the breath energy working in different ways in the body. There's lots to explore. Give yourself a really detailed catalog of all the little parts of the body and how the breath energy is working in there. Or you can experiment focusing on parts of the body you hadn't focused on before, the breath, say, in your knees or the breath in the base of your spine, the breath at your elbows, the breath in between your fingers, the breath outside your body. There's lots to explore in the present moment. So give the mind work to do, to see if you can stir it up and get some energy going. Then the traditional ones, you can, if you've memorized any chants, just think them to yourself. Get up and walk around. If you find yourself still sleepy when you get up and walk around, okay, it's the time you really do need to get some rest. But don't just give in to the hindrance when it comes. Learn to question it. The same with worry and anxiety or restlessness. These things that you're worried about, if they really happened, what would be the best way to prepare for them? Not by spending the whole night worrying and wearing yourself out. You're going to need mindfulness. You're going to need alertness. You're going to need to have an inner sense of strength that you can draw on. And this is what the meditation is all about. It strengthens these good qualities in the mind that you can use in any situation, if you're willing to use them. So the best way to prepare for future contingencies is to strengthen the mind as much as you can. Gain practice in being as mindful as possible, as alert as possible. Open to new ways of thinking. And also try to get that perspective on future dangers. There's that great passage where the monk is going to dangerous part of India and takes leave of the Buddha. And the Buddha says, you know, the people there are reputed to be pretty, pretty savage. What if they curse you? And the monk would say, well, I think these people are very good and that they're not hitting me. What if they hit you? I think they're very good and they're not throwing stones at me. What if they throw stones at you? I think they're very good and they're not stabbing me. What if they stab you? 
think these people are very good and civilized, they're not killing me. What if they kill you? At least my death wouldn't have been a suicide. Learn how to think in those ways, and you, you put the dangers and worries of life into a much better perspective. And finally, there's uncertainty. We start questioning, well, who really knows? Does this really work or not? Maybe nobody knows. Maybe it's all just a charade. This practice of sitting here like a fool, looking at, looking at your breath day in and day out. Well, if you look at it like a fool, it's going to be foolish. Here you've got the chance of looking at your mind, observing it. The Buddha said the way to overcome uncertainty is to check and see what the mind is doing that's skillful and what's unskillful. In other words, learn how to look at cause and effect as they actually show themselves in your life, in your actions. And you notice that okay, skillful actions do require more mindfulness, more alertness. And here's a good way of testing it. Can you sit with your breath mindfully for a whole hour and not forget it? Can you be alert to the movements of the mind that are causing you to suffer? What better way would there be of seeing these things than sitting right here with nothing else to distract you? And then really be observant. This makes all the difference in the world. There are all those meditation techniques out there, but no technique can guarantee you awakening simply following the rules, following the instructions. There's got to be that added quality, the ability to learn how to question, say, take the technique, master it, and then use it as an opportunity to observe your mind in action, to see where it's creating suffering and where it's not. As John Lee once said, monks can sit and meditate till they die buried in heaps of yellow robes. They still not reach nirvana. Lay people can sit and meditate until their backs are all bent over and still not reach nirvana if they're not observant. You take the technique and you develop it and you use it as an opportunity to really to catch the mind in action, to see where it's causing stress, and also to catch it in action when it's not causing stress. And you see, there really is a difference in your ability to meditate. To develop these skills is what enabled you to see. So what we're doing here requires both tranquility to get everything calmed down enough so you can actually watch for a while, and the questioning of insight that leads to insight that's not willing to take everything for granted, that's willing to look at all the of courses in the mind and say, well, maybe it isn't of course. Of course the mind has to worry. Of course it has to be bound up in sensual desire. How else could people live? Well, maybe it's not of course. Learn to question these things. like Isaac Newton. It was the nature of things to fall. Well, why do they fall? He asked that question. Other people thought it was a stupid question, because after all, it's just their nature to fall. Well, why? And it's because he asked the question, that's where he learned things. So it's the same with the meditation. You work at the technique, but you've got to learn how to question the mind as it's mastering the technique. That's where it really starts making a difference.